Yeah, that, oh. yeah that, that, I, I did that intentionally with that song. I, okay. I, I mean, based on what the song's about, it's kind of like a... Um, for me, it's an exploration of my relationship to religion mm -hmm. and to guilt. Um, and unfortunately, those things um, kind of come bundled up sometimes. And, uh, and I wanted the end of that song to kind of be something to maybe like snap the listener out of that space. Okay. Yeah. Now, did you... Did you write all the music and all the lyrics yeah. on your own? Yeah, I write all the lyrics, all the music, all that. And then what is, I mean, I watched the KTLA interview of you, uh -huh. and you described yourself as a folk singer. Were you always drawn to folk music? Is that why you went in this direction? No, I think as a, as a, as a kid, I probably liked pop music a lot. Okay. Paula Abdul, I think, was like my first cassette that I ever owned. Okay. Um, and then I started to really get into rap music. Okay. I loved rap music. Was that your UCI days? No. Uh, <laughs> that nah. wouldn't surprise me. I don't know. I, my UCI days, I, I might have liked some rap, but I think, yeah. Um, I think it was probably a medley of music by the time I got to college. Okay. Um, and then, yeah, and then I found folk music and I was like, wow, this is fantastic. I, I found, like, I didn't discover Bob Dylan until my mid 20s. And then I was like, wow, this guy's amazing. I, I love his music. I love that he's saying something. And, it struck a chord. Kevin, as the engineer at UCI, the manager, what did you think of that? Nice. Yeah. He's got a great voice. Thank you. Is that something we can play on KUCI? <laughs> that would be I'll awesome. Give, oh, we have some extras. Okay. <laughs> um, so, you know, so what's the process? You've written the album, you've got the music down, you've got the lyrics down. Um, you know, do you kind of pass it by some musicians that you know, and then, you know, how do you get like, how do you make an album? Yeah, how do you end up getting it into... That form. Into this form, right. fans, which is includes, you know, artwork, as well as the actual, you know, how do you develop the artwork for the... Right, right. That, which I love, the wax. Yeah. I love um, waxing my... Albums. Well, I mean, you know, this room's filled with CDs, mm -hmm. um, and they all, most of them come in, in jewel packs, you know, plastic containers, and... Um, I think the CD and the book are both dinosaurs, and they're going away, unfortunately. Um, and I, saw, I thought to myself, well, why don't I create something that um, is special? And, and I think for me, one of the big joys about purchasing music is to feel it in your hands. And I wanted, I wanted the listeners to have an experience. I wanted when they grabbed this book, I wanted them to, to know that I took a lot of effort in making this, not only the music, mm -hmm. but this entire experience, so that they would take a moment, appreciate it, and have moments. I think for me, my, the album is mostly about moments, like the, the abrupt end of that song I just played. Right. There's a moment there where you're not expecting an abrupt end, and you don't know what to think, and in those moments where you don't know what to think, I think that's where beauty kind of like percolates through for all of us, is when our mind stops or can't comprehend something. Or, um, and so I think, with this presentation, I, I wanted it to be beautiful, and I wanted it to, to stop people. Um, and, and knowing kind of that we live in an age where there's so much great music that we never get exposed to, right. I had to ask myself, well, how can I differentiate my music, or at least create something that people are going to want to listen to or want to appreciate? And that's how I kind of came about this idea. So I, not only did I have to then record an album, I had to print a book. You know, mm -hmm. so I did a lot of research on on book printing. I learned the ins and outs of it, and found a company up in Idaho. And um, you know, even even so far as like each of the albums has a sticker with a number on it. You know, we did fifteen hundred of them. Now, did you design the yeah. artwork for? No, Corey, the guy who oh, did the drawings. Oh, he did all of it. He did okay. all the design. Okay. Um, so it was a lot of skyping back and forth, and um, you know. I, I would sketch out what I wanted very poorly, and right. then he'd come back with this amazing, robust, beautiful drawing. Um, so yeah, so that, that's kind of the process. I, I, I do all the wax seals myself. Okay. So kind of um, the book comes to me, you know, with, with just this envelope. Okay. Um, and I put the CD and I wax them myself and uh, wax seal it myself. And, and, and that's kind of nice because I know that every single copy that somebody has, I get to like put my, my final stamp approval, stamp of approval on it and um, kind of wish it good luck to wh whatever CD player it finds itself in. Well, I mean, it's beautiful artwork for sure. I mean, it's a beautiful package. Yeah, you thank you. You definitely achieved what you wanted to, I think. Um, so we talked about how you wrote the music, but let's talk about your singing, your chops. I mean, did you always have that? Did you take voice lessons? Uh, is this I, just I, all you in the raw, rawest form? This is me in the rawest <laughs> form. I, um, I, I did, 
I did take voice lessons with this <laughs> this man named Honeyball Means. Is his name? Is that was that? It? Yeah, Honeyball Means. Um, and and I was I, I used to walk my dog and play the guitar and sing at the same time. I like I loved the guitar so much when I first started playing that that's all I wanted to do. So if I could find a space to play it, I would. And dog walking was definitely one of those times. <laughs> and my neighbor was this man named Honeyball, and he heard me sing. And he, he said, I'll give you some singing lessons. I said, great. Um, and uh, he's a, a really interesting guy. Um, but uh, one of the, the things that he was really encouraging me to do in my singing is to be more authentic. And I, I think I still struggle with that. Like, I notice that my singing voice and my speaking voice, there's a, there's a difference between the two of them. And, and I'm working to, to bridge that gap. I don't take singing lessons anymore. Okay. But um, I think that's probably a theme in my own life is just becoming more and more authentic about um, my experience in life um, and that's challenging to do you know to really bear it all and I think the most successful singers the singers that really um, the, the, the singers that I really kind of relate to or the people I want to hear are the ones that are just like open chest here it is let's let's hear it and um, to be a little bit self-critical I don't I, I don't think I'm anywhere near that yet but I'd like to get there but you're striving yeah yeah I think I, I think but I also think that's the beauty of art or that's the beauty of, of of being an artist is that you get to put together a body of work and if, if your first piece was like your last piece what would be the point of doing any pieces in between right. so this is a representation of where I am now an authentic an authentically inauthentic <laughs> singing <laughs> voice right how did you gonna play another song for us which which song is it and what was the inspiration behind this song this song's not on the album um, oh this is something new you're working on it's called dreamer um, and it's uh, it was inspired I was born and raised in Santa Monica my grandfather was an actor um, yes, Days of Our Lives. That's right, I McDonald Carey. Yeah. <laughs> um, but kind of being from Los Angeles and seeing all the people move to Los Angeles with hopes of becoming famous, oftentimes they don't even care to master their craft, they just want fame. Uh, that, that's kind of what the song is about. Okay. So. Came out to find new shores, a broken girl from Baltimore. She came out to make it under Hollywood lights. Started working the graveyard shift, it all down there off the Sunset Strip, but serving hotcakes wasn't scratching the edge. Charles, who had a big white smile and a business card. Charles said, baby, I'm going to make you a star. And she sang, oh, I'm a dreamer. I've been dreaming every day. But ain't no good in dreaming if you can't dream away your pain. Oh, I'm a dreamer. I've been dreaming all those days. But ain't no good in dreaming. Swallowed a pride while she swallowed his. Turns out Charles wasn't into keeping promises. Next in was Ruthless Jim. He had an empty stare and a toothless grin. Jim said, I can't make you a star, but I'll get you high. Up, up, and away she flew, man. She chased them dragons till her veins turned blue. Sweet lady of Hollywood night. And she sang, Oh, I'm a dreamer. I've been dreaming every day. But ain't no good cool in dreaming if you can't dream away your pain. Oh, I'm a dreamer. I've been dreaming all these days. But ain't no good cool in dreaming if you can't dream yourself. Dream yourself away. Next up was poor old Joe, fresh off the train from Idaho. And Joe said, Excuse me, ma'am, can you 
you show me round With a big white smile she said why yes And she turned Joe into quite a mess Perfect welcome to Los Angeles Did you ever talk to your grandfather about what it was like to to be a struggling actor? Um, I never talked to him about that. I think probably because I never saw him struggling. You know, okay. he was always quite successful. So, um, but also I was young. He passed away when I was eleven or twelve. So I I don't think any of those things were ever. Okay, they really were kind of in, in your, my consciousness in your at that mind time. space. Yeah. yeah. Um, so that's a song that isn't on this first album, so you're working on another one. How many songs do you have, and is that near Yeah, that's going to be on the new album. There's probably five or six so far okay. on the new one, but um, we'll see kind of when it all comes to uh, together. So no hard date as to when you want to have this album out? No, I mean, we'll see. It's, uh, I, wish, I wish I could have a hard date, mm -hmm. but a lot of it's out of your own control. You know, it's, there's a lot of people involved in making a record. You have producers and other musicians who play on it and things like that. Is that, is that, you know, working with now record company or producers, is that as messy as it sometimes can seem? Where, you know, there's hard dates for this and you, you they don't like this song so you have to change it, it's not commercial enough per se. Do you, are you bumping into any of that? Well, fortunately, I'm an independent musician okay. so I don't have a record company to okay. work with. Um, I just work with different producers. I finance it all myself, you know. Um, and fortunately, the cost of making an album isn't that high anymore. Okay. You know, it's uh, there's, there's the technology has gotten to the point where you can make an album for, for relatively inexpensive yeah. um, amount of money. With that being said, uh, it's always nice to have a budget, though. Right. Um, and so, you know, the hope is that the first album performs well enough that you can finance the second album. And okay, and so on. Okay, yeah. so where can people get your album? Yeah, so the album's available online on iTunes. Um, if you if you type in Odds O D D space U S, you can find it on iTunes. But if you want the physical copy, which I, I, I highly recommend, um, go to Odds dot com, mm -hmm. um, and you can you can purchase a copy of that, or you can come to a show. I always sell the albums at shows. So. And where do you play? Where can people find you? In what days of the week and times? Yeah, I don't play a regular set anywhere, but I uh, I tend to play at the Wits End a lot, which okay. is in Venice, or the Hotel Cafe in Hollywood. Are your perform? Do you list your performance dates? On yeah, your online. Website? I always, I always uh, do it, and you can follow me on Facebook too. And that's probably the best way to know. Uh, we're, we're we are releasing a new music video that we just finished uh, probably this week, so uh, that's exciting as well. Well, I'm glad that you brought that up. That you're um, because I found you. Well, actually, someone sent me a link of you doing a movie. So you're involved. You're acting, um, and it's called Becoming Bulletproof. And it involves um, people with a range of disabilities, and it seems like a very personal project. So, can you talk about that and how you got involved? And are you kind of taking up where your grandpa <laughs> kind of left off? Is this a new, another area that you're going to be involved in? To answer your last question first, there's no way I could be ever picking up where my grandfather <laughs> left off. No, no, no. Um, so, this movie it's called Becoming Bulletproof. Um, it, it's it, we're, we're making it, or we've already made it. It's done. Um, and the, the group of us that are making it is a group called Zeno Mountain Farm. And it's an organization that celebrates the creative arts um, for people with and without disabilities. And, and the idea underneath everything is that no one pays to come to camp and no one gets paid to be there. So it's all volunteers. Um, How did you find this group? How did you get involved? My brother's friend started the, the camp. Okay. Um, so it's a, it's a residential camp in Venice. Uh, California, and I actually lived there for three years as well. Oh, you did? Okay. Yeah, um, but this is this is just one of many movies we've made. But this one is by far the best movie we've made so far. Um, it's a fantastic film. We did a we did a premiere of it in L.A. Um, and and there's going to be New York premiere and a D.C. premiere, um, and then we'll probably go on the, the festival circuit with it because it really is a fantastic movie. Um, well, give it give us the summary of the movie. What summary of the expect? movie. Well, it's a story about. Um, about a, a, a young man whose great-great-grandfather um, opened a bar 
and he still owns it to this day. But unfortunately, there's this big developer that wants to come in and buy off, buy up the bar so we can build this disgustingly large thing. So big, bad corporate. Got right, it. exactly. <laughs> but he, the, this, this, the guy has to find the deed. He can't find his deed to it. And if he can't find his deed, it's going to go up for auction. And so we, he gets taken back in time to how the deed was ever um, won in the first place first place by his great great grandfather who's named bulletproof jackson who's a, uh, a magician um and an unsuccessful ma magician um and you kind of see him go up against this uh this other big bad quote-unquote corporation but this time it's just a big bad cowboy okay um and it, yeah it's just a really fun fantastic film and 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 the lead actors are people at camp who have disabilities um uh, and there's also actors who don't have disabilities as well who play big parts i i don't play a very big part um, at all in it, but it's a great, great movie. So. Who, what is your role? Who do you play? I, I have two <laughs> roles. I, I, I play, in, in present time, I play a bar patron. Okay. And I'm a big fan of the music selections in the jukebox. And then when we go back in time, I play the bartender. Okay. So, yeah. Um, so was this, was the movie written by the group? Yeah, yeah, okay. we all write it together. We kind of uh, there's a group that kind of gets together and writes it. I, I'm not part of that group, Okay. unfortunately. I'd like to take credit, but I can't. 